This is 10 with Zen, a podcast hosted by Helen Woodward, leadership consultant and former head of school improvement at the Department for Education. Brought to you by Zen Educate, each episode features a prominent guest sharing insights and best practice based on their own unique experiences. This could be as a school leader, an SEN specialist, a parent and beyond. If you like the sound of 10 with Zen, make sure you follow and subscribe on Spotify, Apple or whatever platform you're listening on. Welcome to 10 with Zen. My guest today is Maria Brosnan, Educational Leadership Health and Wellbeing Specialist and founder of Pursuit Wellbeing. Welcome to 10 with Zen, Maria. Thank you, Helen. I'm so excited to be talking with you today because I've listened to you speaking about sleep previously and I found it really helpful. So I'm hoping that our listeners will also be able to benefit from the discussion that we have today. Great. Yeah, me too. Great to be here with you today. So I know you've done lots of research about this. So can you tell us how does excessive stress impact on our sleep and what can we do about it? Mm, I think a good place to start is by casting our minds back 200,000 years (laughs) and thinking about cavemen ancestors, cavemen and women ancestors living in a cave and just imagine that it's getting close to bedtime. And they're out there, you know, looking at the stars and the moon and there's a rustle, an unmistakable rustle in the grass of a predator. So instantly their stress response would turn on and wake them up because no matter how sleepy they were before, automatically when we're, when we perceive a danger or a threat, we turn on our stress response and that produces adrenaline and cortisol and a whole cocktail of other biochemicals. And we do exactly the same thing. We have exactly the same physiology as our caveman ancestors. So when we're stressed, we produce the same biochemistry. And even though it might not be just before bed, Cortisol can stay in our system for up to eight hours. So we can, we can get that awful feeling of being tired and wired. And we know that we're exhausted and we want to sleep, but we just can't because our minds are so active. And it's because of the biochemistry of what's happened to us all throughout the day. And so sleeplessness is actually a wonderful feature of the stress response. But anthropologists would say that our cavemen ancestors would have triggered that maybe two to four times a week. And if you think about how many times we trigger that all throughout the day, you know, a a difficult meeting or, you know, people kicking off or getting stuck in traffic or an argument with a spouse or all different kinds of things can trigger us all throughout the day. And so we have this biochemistry just rushing around our systems. So sleeplessness doesn't just happen when we go to bed. It's the result of everything that's happened all throughout the day. So what we can do to manage that is anything we can do throughout the day to reduce stress will have an impact on our sleep at night. Okay, so so actually one of the things you're saying is this stress response we have is our friend. Absolutely. It's a protective element of our lives. Absolutely. It's a survival mechanism. It is literally our survival mechanism. And we have survived for hundreds of thousands of years because of it. But it's a maladaptive response in our modern busy lives because we keep turning it on because we can't tell the difference sometimes between a real threat or a real danger or an imagined one. Like we can turn on the stress response from an email and it was designed to to keep us safe from a tiger. So it's, it's a maladapted response now and we need to learn new skills in how to manage that. Now, that's that's interesting because what you've just said is we can turn the stress response on in response to an email. But what I just want to ask you about is the turn it on, because when I'm stressed, I don't kind of consciously think I'm just going to turn my stress response on now. (laughs) So so just tell me what happens, because it's not you don't kind of think it and then it happens do you. Tell me what what actually happens. Yeah, absolutely. It's all governed by our autonomic nervous system. So autonomic is just another name for automatic. And so these things happen instantaneously. 95% of the functions in our body are unconscious or subconscious. We don't consciously think, "Mm, I'm just going to digest that lovely lunch I just had. All of these things, uh, digestion, respiration, reproduction, are all sitting below our consciousness. We don't need to think about these things. They're working beautifully our stress response fits in. It's, a, it's governed by our autonomic nervous system. And there's a, a lovely word for this called neuroception. When we either perceive danger or a lack of safety, and they're two quite different things. But if we have that sense that something, there's either danger or a lack of safety, that neuroception, it could be just a funny feeling. It could be something that we just sense. It turns it on, just turns on that system. And most of us, don't know how to turn it off 
and that's definitely a skill that we learn we can we can learn how to turn it off most of us it all just kind of peters out so the the threat passes and the email is de de dealt with or the difficult conversation is over but we ruminate and we think about it and we play it over in our minds and so the process that mental process can carry on the stress response way longer and then it kind of just peters out not many people know how to turn it off okay so so uh, i'm interested in the phrase that you had there about a threat to safety which you said was, was different to threat to life yeah so a threat to safety and that includes um, i'm asking the question that includes a threat to what we've experienced as our psychological safety absolutely so if you think in say a staff meeting is a good example of this where nothing might be happening nobody's screaming or yelling nobody's threatening to hit you <laughs> But there's this underlying sense that they could like there's a there's a lack of safety. Somebody could say something, it all could kick off. So that's what I mean, that there's a it's a perception of a lack of safety. Does that make sense? It, it does. And it's it's reminding me of some reading that I did recently about um, in the culture code, where it talks very much about how our belonging to the group is so important for us as humans. Absolutely. And actually, some of that lack of safety is about, is this group going to keep me as somebody who belongs in this group, or do I run the risk of being ostracised? Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, in some schools, that can be really, you know, the stakes can be quite high. I worked in what was called EBD at the time, you know, Emotional and Behavioural Difficulties mm -hmm. School. And actually, if your team didn't support you, you, actually, you could be in quite, you could be in danger. Yeah. Yeah. And schools, you know, there's a, I, I really can't stand this word, but it's it's a common parlance of, of the toxic kind of environment in schools. And for many people, that's their reality, that schools can be quite a toxic and challenging place. So even though nobody's yelling at you, there's still this kind of neuroception, this underlying, this kind of feeling that you're not quite safe. And that's as stressful as a tiger running on your path. The effects of it build up over time. Okay. Okay. And I want to ask you two questions now. Firstly, when you're in that kind of hyper aroused state of being really tired, but also your stress hormones are kind of keeping you wide awake and alert, how do you deal with that? But I'm also interested in your advice to somebody who finds themselves in a work situation where this is being triggered for them like every day and what the long term consequences could be and what your advice would be. And let's start by talking about actually how do we pull down from that you know it's 11 30 at night i'm so tired i've got to be up at five but i'm wide awake because my stress hormones are doing a dance yeah 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 well i think let's take a little step back and and ask even just invite the listeners to consider this what is stress so helen if i would say to you what's stress for you but how do you know so if you're saying oh god i'm so stressed how do you know that you're stressed I know I'm stressed when my heart rate rises. So I feel that I feel that in my chest. Um, and I and I have a kind of restlessness, you know, like my concentration diminishes rapidly. So I can be reading something and it's just not going in. So actually it massively impairs my cognitive processing. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's all different kinds of physiological things that happen in your your mental processing, in your emotions. You can be, feel anxious or angry or upset in your physical body. As you said, your heart rate increases, blood rushes to the extremity so you can fight, you can take on the threat or you can get away. So when these things happen to your point of what what do you do at 11 30 at night it's almost too late at 11 30 at night you need to manage these things all throughout the day but having said that of course it's never too late personally i find the most important time is before i go to bed so that last kind of 30 to 45 minutes so i put in place quite a lot of rituals so i make sure that i turn off you know, especially social media. The worst thing for me is if I, oh, I quickly check social media before I go to bed, like, oh my God, ah! and I, you know, I'm aflame with whatever it has just, I've just read or seen. So make sure that I don't consume any social media or news or anything like that close to bedtime that I, you know, wash my face and take my time and I have essential oils and I might do a little scalp massage, like really simple for 10 seconds. It's not for five minutes, but have little things in place that I do a little meditation. I turn the lights down low. I make sure that, that, that um, my bedroom is comfortable and cozy and I prepare for bed. And so I have a whole little stream of rituals that 
get me ready for sleep and my body knows that it's time to calm down and it does deal with all of the, that biochemistry because I, I find if I'm working really late and I really want to get something finished then I finish it shut the laptop and go to bed let's just hopeless <laughs> that's when I'm lying there going oh my god so th for me personally it's it's that time before bed to have a lot of rituals in place that are really pleasant and things that you really like like reading or foot soak foot massage whatever you find enjoyable and i'd like to invite our listeners to think what do you enjoy what's helpful for you and start to gently introduce them it's these small everyday things that make our well-being it's the small everyday things that make up our well-being not just some great big thing it's not a big holiday it's not the big things that make the difference it's the small things that make a difference there's some really key messages there about the small things that we do that make a difference rituals in the particularly in the half hour before we go to sleep and finding ways of creating a very safe kind of space, you know, that your bedroom is safe, that the lights are dim, that things are comfortable and that you feel a nurturing environment, really. Beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. And are there little things that we can do throughout the day that actually help prepare us to sleep as well? Definitely. So in addition to making sure that you manage stress well, I would say meal times are really important because that really affects our blood sugar levels and our blood sugar levels have a direct impact on our cortisol levels as well. So it's not only stress that triggers cortisol, it's blood sugar. And so many, many, many educators I know don't eat lunch mm -hmm. and then have a whole pile of biscuits at four o'clock because they're starving. And that's something that I hear so often. So my advice around that would be make sure you have three decent meals a day and make sure you have lunch because if you miss lunch, then your blood sugar is going to drop. And then if you have half a packet of biscuits at four o'clock, then your blood sugar will spike. So it's this crazy kind of up and down that's really unhelpful. So what we're looking to do is to manage all kinds of things. So manage our biochemistry, manage our blood sugar, manage our moods and emotions, self-regulation is the key. And the interesting thing I think is most of these things are pleasant. <laughs> That, that we're that I'm recommending people do they're good nice things that we that we enjoy make sure to have some lunch if that's difficult then make enough dinner that you can take some leftovers with you so even if that's a quick meal it might not be half an hour or anything like that but even if you can have something quick to eat at lunchtime that will make a difference to your cortisol and that will impact your sleep yeah nice and really good really good ideas about actually make some extra dinner so you've got a lunch box for the next day yeah. Uh, Maria, it's been a brilliant to talk with you today. I know that you've got a book as well called The Pursuit of Sleep. Do you want to tell us about that just quickly before we finish? Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a really simple little book. It's very beautiful, lots of pictures and diagrams in it. But we talk about kind of quite a lot of what we've just talked about, what stress is, where it comes from, and 95 tips to help you manage that all throughout the day. Because there are key points all throughout the day when you start your day, your commute, you know, lunch, after school, you know, closing off your work day, coming home in the evening. So there's lots of points throughout the day that could be pinch points for you. And so we've just outlined them all and invite people to reflect on, on what the what the kind of difficult times in your day, the most challenging times and what you can do to manage that. So there's 95 ideas on, on what you can do to manage stress, to reduce that all throughout the day so that when you come to put your head on the pillow, you're not tired and wired, that you're ready to have a good night's sleep. And that's The Pursuit of Sleep by Maria Brosnan. Thank you. Yes. And that's available at my website, which is pursuit-wellbeing.com. Brilliant. Thank you so much for being our guest today on 10 with Zen. It's an absolute pleasure. Great to meet you, Helen. Thank you for your time. For our listeners, we always follow up our podcast podcast with a transcript of the discussion and we'll include the links so you can find the books and references we've been talking about today. Thank you so much for listening to 10 with Zen. 10 with Zen is brought to you by Zen Educate. Zen Educate's online platform puts you in control of supply and recruitment and they've saved UK schools over three million pounds by allowing them to connect with teachers and TAs directly. To receive 50% off your first day booked with Zen, just DM us on Twitter at Zen Educate and quote 10 with Zen. Thanks for listening.